Hello, I'm Bill Whalen. I'm the Virginia Hobbs Carpenter Distinguished Policy Fellow here at the Hoover Institution, and I'd like to welcome you back to a special holiday edition of our Saints, Sinners, and Salvageables podcast. This is special in at least two regards. One, we're adding pictures to the sound instead of our usual podcast. So for those of you for the past couple of months who've been listening to the wisdom of Ben Ginsburg and his guests, you now get to see Ben's decidedly handsome face. This is also special in this regard in that I want you to think of this show as a turducken. Those of you who don't know what a turducken is, maybe you didn't watch John Madden on TV broadcast who made this famous. A turducken is a deboned chicken that is inside a deboned duck, which is inside a deboned turkey. Uh, I'm sure that's just really low on calories. <laughs> but here's why this show is a turducken. First, we're going to talk about uh, some election day results with one of our guests who's been following the election denial, election integrity issue for some time now. We're going to get her thoughts on, on what played out on election day. Then we're going to go to a second topic, which is the topic of election uh, integrity and election denial moving forward now that Donald Trump is an announced candidate. Is this an issue solely wed to Donald Trump or will we see other prominent uh, officials across the country pick it up and run with it? Which then ties into our third big topic, which is going to be the holiday season. Those of you who happen to be driving somewhere, flying somewhere to gather with family and sit down and have a polite dinner that you hope. But what happens if somebody at the table, what happens if you want to bring up the topic of politics and there happens to be somebody at the table who is decidedly wed to one extreme of this topic. Maybe they think that all votes are suppressed. They think that all elections are stolen. How does one have a calm, rational conversation? So joining me today to talk about all of this and to share on the turducken, because it takes a lot of cooks to produce a turducken. First off, my colleague, Ben Ginsburg, the Volcker Distinguished Family Fellow here at the Hoover Institution. Ben's a nationally known political law advocate. And as I mentioned uh, a minute ago, in the weeks leading up to the election, he was the moderator of the Hoover Institution St. Sinners and Salvage Rules podcast. Cast. And joining us also is Sarah Longwell, the highly respected Republican strategist, president and CEO of the D.C.-based Longwell Partners. Makes her a swamp creature, I guess. Sarah is also co-chair of the organization Defending Democracy Together and executive director of the Republican Accounting Accountability Project. And keeping in our holiday theme, Sarah can dish it out, but she can take it. Uh, Sarah, any truth to the old thing, saying in Washington, it takes a, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen? Yeah. I mean, look, what do they say? Politics ain't beanbag. Uh, you got to be prepared to meet your everybody lives here. All the everyone who does politics. So all, all your uh, all your enemies, if you're in politics, they're all here. So you got to be able to, you know, it used to be I, this is I maybe you guys know this. It used to be that uh, you would, you know, fight it out really hard over policy and then like grab a drink uh in dc which is always sort of how i've approached things i do think things got hotter during the trump era and it 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 is as things have polarized both in the country i think it's polarized in dc uh a little bit as well i think there's less um less hanging out uh between the two sides which is too bad but it's good because there's this new team called the democracy team and we all hang out and it's really fun (laughs) It's the Ginsburg effect. The less that Ben Ginsburg has been on television, the more heated the debate. So, Ben, you got to step up your TV and calm the masses. There you go. Well, I keep, uh, you know, the 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 fact is there are now Republican bars and Democratic bars and uh, democracy bars, and uh, you got to figure out which has the best uh, the best shots and uh, the best uh, the best food to go with. Okay. Now, do I call you Chef Sarah or Chef Longwell? Which title do you prefer? Uh, you know, a lot of people call me Longwell. I was a bit of a jock uh, growing up. So people like call me by my last name. People in my office call me by my last name. So Chef Longwell is great. Yeah, okay, Sarah's Chef. a cook for all season. <laughs> there you go. Okay, Sarah, let's start with you. Uh, you have been spending a lot of time talking to groups, trying to get the feel of uh, that percentage out there that uh, buys into election integrity, buys into election denial, uh, been about 30% of the electorate, right? But you yes. walked into this election kind of having a feel for where they were based on what you saw uh, earlier this month on election day. Did anything surprise you with the results? I mean, look, I, I'm a little bit surprised at the results in terms of just how poorly Republicans fared, like how much of a clean sweep it was across the swing states. That being said, um, you know, because I was talking to swing voters every week for the last I, I mean, I, I started doing the focus groups back in 2019. And um, since the pandemic, I've been doing them at basically a weekly clip. So so right. just in sort of constantly listening to voters. And in the last six months, mostly the swing voters or undecided voters. And, you know, one of the things that was just very clear uh, and that I talked a lot about on my on my focus group podcast um, that Ben has been on 
uh, is that even though when you would ask voters, hey, how do you think things are going in the country? They would say bad. They did not think things were going well. They would talk about inflation. They would talk about uh, the economy, supply chain, crime. Uh, you asked them about Biden. They were not feeling good about Biden and the job that he was doing. But then when you got to kind of the vote choice, you'd say, well, then who are you going to vote for? Blake Masters or Mark Kelly? Who are you going to vote for? You know, Carrie Lake or Katie Hobbs, Josh Shapiro, uh, Josh Shapiro or Doug Mastriano. And right. it just over and over again, the swing voters were breaking hard for the Democrats. And now, and I'll just say these swing voters, as we characterize them, they tend to be people who voted for Trump in 2016 and then Biden in 2020, uh, because those are the people Democrats needed to hold. And those are the people who just were sort of swingy in this moment, kind of rejecting uh, Trump and Trumpism. And the fact is they didn't like these candidates. And that was clear. Uh, and, and you know, it, it was interesting, too, that abortion is obviously people wondering kind of what role abortion played in the election has been a big topic of conversation. Mm -hmm. And I was the focus groups are really useful in that they helped us get under the hood on the polling, which showed that the economy and inflation were the big issues for voters. And that was true in the focus groups. But when you would get to that vote choice, the way that the one of the reasons that people found these candidates to be so extreme is that they thought they had extreme positions on abortion. That was one of the first things that people would cite about why they didn't want to vote for Lake Masters. Or that's why they didn't want to vote for Adam Laxalt is that they thought they had extreme positions on abortion. And they thought they were extreme in other ways, too, you know, uh, election denialism. But they they kind of sometimes people want to isolate these things. You know, they want to say, well, people were voting on democracy or people were voting on abortion. You know, the, what happened with these candidates is they were just they were lousy candidates who were extreme and who were both tended to be sort of extreme on abortion and extreme on democracy issues. And it, it sort of all layered into the picture of a candidate that was too far outside, uh, just too far outside the comfort zone for a lot of these voters. Mm -hmm. hey, hey, Sarah, what do you think the perspective of Trump voters is as to the results? You know, that's a good question. So I, and it's it's. I will say I don't love to speculate about what voters might think. I like to usually just tell you what I've heard them say and what I what I know that they think. Um, but I will say that the voters, um, there's different kinds of Trump voters, right? There's like a lot under the uh, along the spectrum of people who voted for Trump. And right. I would say that the the sort of people there's uh, I think a helpful way to think about them just for this question is. There are people who think of themselves as sort of Republican voters first, and then there are people who think of themselves as Trump voters first. Um, and the people who are sort of Republican voters, a lot of them are, are have been with the party a long time. I think those are the kinds of people who think, hey, we've now lost three cycles in a row. This is right. just unacceptable. Like if because if you believe, right, um, that the Democrats and I think a lot of these voters do believe that the Democrats are like an existential threat to the things that they believe in. Mm -hmm. They want to win, right? They want to win. They wanted to send a message to Joe Biden. They wanted to send a corrective to Joe Biden uh, by by winning this this election. I do think, though, the people who are Trump first voters tend to operate less sort of as pundits or as people who are operating in that way. And they're more just like, I think it's fun to watch Trump blow things up. I think it's fun to watch candidates who like Carrie Lake, who deny elections, um, who are going to like stick it to people. I like seeing them run. And I don't know that those voters necessarily take the medicine that came with the message that the, just got sent um, because they are much more ideological is not quite the right word, but they're much more sort of committed um, to a certain partisan pose and posture that these candidates gave them like they liked uh, the way that they own the libs and that they go after the media. But for the people who are thinking about, boy, I really want Republicans to be in charge and I'd really right. like to curb Democrat excesses, they're thinking, I think, coming out of this being like, this is enough's enough on this. Well, Sarah, let, yeah. let me let me ask you this, Sarah. Um, the the election denier in Pennsylvania, they don't have anything to stand on right now. Their guy got crushed to the tune of hundreds of thousands of votes. But let's go to Maricopa County and uh, where Carrie Lake uh, very prominently, uh, very, very loudly talked about a stolen election right now. Uh, do you see the temperature cooling in a county like that, or is this that let's just put another log on the fire? Well, I mean, a lot of times the temperature is dictated by the candidate, right? So, I mean, Doug Mastriano, yeah, you're right. He got wiped out by 14 points. He also didn't contest anything, right? Yeah. Uh, and he just he conceded 
Adam Laxalt conceded, like a bunch of these uh, candidates, even though they are election deniers, they have conceded in the very normal way that we have peaceful transi- transitions of power in this country and all kinds of races. Carrie mm-hmm. Lake has yet to do that. Uh, although I don't know that it's clear. Uh, I don't know it's clear yet um, whether or not she is going co- to contest it in a way that is scary. You know, um, I, I just don't think we know that yet. Uh, it's a, the, the, the margin is narrow, but it's not narrow enough for a recount. It is still a decisive margin. Um, and so a lot of times, yeah, it's just the temperature is dictated by whether or not these candidates want to go for it the way Trump did. Uh, right. Carrie Lake is probably of all the candidates, though, the most Trump like. Uh, like one of the things these other candidates who I think are conceding and not trying to contest it, one of the key elements in being an effective election denier is that people believe you, right? Mm-hmm. People did believe Trump when he said it. Um, it was, you know, it was national in scope. He could, um, uh, he could, he could sort of ramp all kinds of different people up. These are in like one race, uh, and you have to have. I don't like to use the word charisma because it sounds like a positive word, but like you have to be able to convince people that uh, that something really went wrong. Carrie right. Lake might. And, and the reason that the Carrie Lake thing, too, I think is just different from everything else is like they did have some trouble in Maricopa County with some voting machines. And so she does have something to sort of point to to try to say that something was nefarious. Um, but we'll wait and see whether or not it gets, uh, you know, she kind of goes full refusal to concede. She is putting she is putting uh, Twitter strings up with voters who say they were somehow disenfranchised. Significantly, none of that has found its way to a courtroom. Mm. And uh, she is vi- or visited Mar- Mar-a-Lago. So we'll still need to see what uh, comes from that. I'd like your two thoughts on her in particular, but just in general about monetizing or weaponizing this. So Ben mentioned the court route, but then there's also the financial route because it seems to me in this day and age, it's pretty easy to raise money. So Sarah and Ben, your two political professionals, are we going to see a lot of people around the country trying to raise money off this topic? Well, I think it's clear election denialism has not gone away. Right. Um, the The fever may have broken the uh, the virus is still in the body politic, and there are mutations out there that can come up. And one thing that Donald Trump and many others running this cycle showed is that they can be well financed uh, through the miracle of the internet. So uh, I, I think election denialism is not is still going to be present with us for a while. Sarah, do you agree? Uh, I do. I think it's like a Pandora's box. Like that tool is now in the toolbox for some candidates in close races. Um, However, I am heartened by this last election and the fact that we have not seen a ton of it. And I do think it's sometimes it's hard to know. There's there's sometimes there were like something happens once and everybody gets really amped up about it. You know, the election denialism, Trump raised all kinds of money off of Stop the Steal. But boredom and... People getting tired is also a hallmark of politics. And so sometimes like I, I sometimes I think it can get played out. I do wonder um, I, and I just don't think other people can pull it off the way Trump did. Uh, I think if anybody can, and I mean this not as a compliment, uh, it is Carrie Lake. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, a lot of times they do just try to monetize it uh, and use it to make themselves bigger stars. But I just, ah, uh, I just think it's harder this this time around. Whenever Trump did it was the first time anybody had done it. And now people are more ready for it. The media is more ready for it. People know how to deal with it better and voters get a little tired of it. So Ben, we saw this uh, with Trump's announcement and uh, Mar-a-Lago, um, you know, kicked around a lot. Some people said, well, it's a little more disciplined maybe than they were expecting. But my takeaway, Ben, is recovering speech writers, that this was basically Donald Trump going on for a very long time, talking about a lot of things not necessarily connected. And uh, two things stood out. Number one, the coverage of it a lot. I saw one very clever comment that he's not the 800-pound gorilla, but he's maybe the 500-pound gorilla. In other words, getting to what Sarah is saying, that maybe this effect is somewhat diminished. But 
Ben, here's what struck me as curious about the speech. I'd like you and Sarah to kick this around next. This is, this is our, uh, as the turducken goes, we've talked about the chicken. Now we're getting into the duck, leading toward the turkey. And this is the duck. This is Donald Trump picking up this message now as an active candidate moving forward. You listen to that speech. You notice Trump did not get into election denial. He did not talk about the results being phony. He didn't single out Arizona. But Ben and Sarah, he sure talked about election integrity when he got into the idea of paper ballots and same day voting, the same message, don't trust the system. So Ben and Sarah, where do we go now? Well, I, I mean, I think he is not going away from the general theme that there are flaws in the election and people should not believe the results. I think that's definitely tied to him. Uh, I don't know. I think he didn't mention election denialism because election deniers in positions of responsibility around the country were not successful on November 8th. Uh, but pointing out flaws in the system, is something, you know, truth is we got 10,000 jurisdictions. They're not all of the same quality. And it's a very human system with lots of volunteers. Mistakes do happen. And he did, he got himself on a rocket ship ride by talking about that as a perpetual issue. Yeah, again, I mean, look, Donald, the mythology of Donald Trump for Donald Trump and for his voters has been that he's a winner, right? right. Like he needs that. And that's why he could never admit defeat and that they don't like to admit defeat. Right. Um, that being said, one of the things I've seen in the focus groups over time is that there really is a sort of a, even people who like Trump, uh, even people who believe that the election was stolen or that something was wrong with it, uh, and there's lots of those people, they still want to look forward. Um, like they really want to talk about Joe Biden. They want to talk about inflation. They want Trump to attack their enemies. And like the whining is getting a little bit thin with them. Um, and I think this goes back to his announcement. I was I was watching it on my phone and, you know, mm -hmm. I view Trump with a lot of uh, like, I believe he's an existential threat to democracy. He has gotten my blood up for years. Man, I was watching him and he was low energy. I was yeah. bored. He's playing his hits. Um, and I just, uh, it's weird. It is hard it, as much as I am now very much aware of the fact that like in the nuclear Holocaust, he is the cockroach that continues to survive. It is hard to watch him now and not think he is much diminished and that there is just something that frisson of danger that he always brings with him. You just know what he's going to say now. And like, it's not that interesting. Um, and so I'm waiting to see what base voters really think about it to see if they are kind of falling away from him. But I do think people want him to look forward and that the election denial stuff and I won 2020 people are like, yeah, 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 I get it. I agree. But like, please talk about something else. Yeah. I, I, you know, one thing that struck me in that speech is that he was reading from the teleprompter and when he reads from the teleprompter, he is just much lower energy than right. he is when he, when he talks <laughs> when he does live riffs off the top of his head, which is, which is, I'm sure, frightening to those who are advising him. But I mean, Sarah's right. He was playing the hits, but that is a song that's still got some popularity. People are still beating their feet to election denialism in Trump world. They are. But, you know, this gets back to my question earlier. Uh, you take a popular Broadway show like Hamilton and you can do a zillion and one off, you know, Broadway productions with, you know, lesser known still singing the greatest hits, if you will. But election denial, does this really work if you're not Donald Trump? Yeah. Ben and I are old men, let's face it, Ben, and we lived back in the 1990s when Ross Perot came out of nowhere. And Ross Perot was, you know, obviously a disruptor. He uh, he greatly affected the 1992 election, but the Perot movement didn't last that long in part because no one else could be Ross Perot. But so this ties to my question about election denial moving forward. If Carrie Lake wants to pick it up or mom with it or other people around the country they're not as performative as trump maybe people aren't as passionate about them as they are donald trump is this the type of topic that has transferability to it like i said if anybody could it's carrie lake because she is yeah. charismatic in a similar way to donald trump like uh yeah. but again look a lot of the potency of donald trump is that when he would do something it would be the first time anybody in modern politics had done the thing Right. And as a result, the media never quite knew how to handle it. Uh, you know, the pundits, like, and, and I just think I'm watching people having learned a lot of lessons. Um, and, and now when Donald Trump does things, even like the, the, the media, for example, uh, a lot of people did not carry his speech 
A lot of people didn't, they just didn't give him the oxygen. Uh, you know, even the New York Post put him on page 26 or something like that, because people <laughs> understand that even if they're criticizing him, something they didn't understand before, they didn't, they understand, right. even if they were criticizing him, they were amplifying him. Right. And now there's a bunch of the media outlets are just, and really the Murdoch, the conservative media outlets are trying to starve him. Uh, of that oxygen. And so the election denial is sort of similar where the first time it happened, everybody's like, what do you do when somebody just doesn't engage in the peaceful transfer of power or lies about an election being stolen? How do you handle it? And right. now a lot more reporters are educated about how elections work. They understand about the voting machines. Like they were prepped for the idea that Carrie Lake was maybe going to say that the election was stolen. She was trying to, she was already setting herself up to do that in her primary if she lost. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it just, it doesn't hit the same way. Yeah, that's a really interesting comparison between Ross Perot and Donald Trump. Um, I do think it will also go down as a case study on the role of social media in transforming politics. Yes. Just because Ross Perot financed this whole campaign, Donald Trump was the biggest small dollar fundraiser in history. Pretty good political science that once you give money to a campaign or to an idea, you feel invested in that. So it'll be it'll be interesting to watch. One last thing I'd like the two of you to discuss while we're in the duck portion of our show, and that is uh, Senate Minority Leader, still Senate Minority Leader, apparently Mitch McConnell, despite an attempted coup by Rick Scott. I found that to be rather interesting logic. I ran the Republican Senatorial Committee, and we did so well, sarcastically, that I now want to be the leader. I, I don't quite get that. But the question of the two of you, I'd like you to kick around. You get invited to Mitch McConnell's office, and he wants to talk to you about the 2024 Senate landscape. Sarah, Ben, you live and swim in this stuff. You know that it is potentially potentially a great time for a Republican Senate candidate in 2024. Look at the map. It's the class one seats. I think there are 33 of them, 23 are Democrats, uh, about eight incumbents out there waffling on whether or not to run. You look inside the Republican seats up for grabs are in pretty safe places. Hard for Democrats to make a pickup. But Ben and Sarah, there's a problem here. You go to Montana where John Tester's up for re-election and Republicans target him every six years. This is a very Trumpy state. You go to West Virginia, maybe the king of Trumpy states where Joe Manchin may run again in 2024. What is Mitch McConnell going to have to do this time around? Because I think there was a lesson here that when you don't get involved in the primaries, you get bad consequences. Well, he didn't get involved in the primaries in 2010 and paid mm -hmm. a terrible price. Right. And then when, when things came back around with wasn't until 2014, he and the senatorial committee and the outside PACs all really dove into primaries. And I suspect he, uh, he will have the ability to do that again in 2024 to take advantage of that map. Mm -hmm. What do you think, sir? Yeah, I agree. Uh, I agree. I also think they're going to all try to get Joe Manchin to run, maybe not as a Democrat. Uh, I think they, they're, you, you, if I if I was sitting with Mitch McConnell's office, I bet he'd be whispering to me. Me and Mitch McConnell don't talk, but I bet he'd be saying, "I think we can get Mansion. I think we can get him to run as a Republican." Uh, so, would you like to be a chairman? That's right. That's right. I bet there's going to be deals on the table. That could be. Okay, let's switch now. Let's get to the big bird in the show, and that is what to do in the holiday season coming up in a couple of days. Ben and Sarah, I want you to uh, play in a hypothetical with me. You are invited to somebody's house. You're invited to your own family's house. You're sitting down with a group of people at the table, and there's that one individual at the table, maybe more. They want to have a conversation about politics, and by God, are they dug in into what they believe. They are the most firmer believer that elections are stolen. They're the most firmer believer that votes are suppressed in every election. They are, shall we say, enthusiastic, ardent what they believe. We could come up with worse uh, descriptions, I guess, but I'm being polite here. They are true believers, uh, depending on their outlook on life. Come the time to have a conversation about that. I turn to Ben Ginsburg as one of these true believers and ask Ben for his thoughts. I ask Sarah for his thoughts. How do you have a calm, rational, polite, civil conversation about politics without A, some form of silverware being tossed at you, or B, food being thrown at you, or C, getting kicked out the kicked out of time? There was a time when we could talk about politics very civilly, but I think we agree civility in politics is going away. So how do we maintain peace and quiet at Thanksgiving dinner? Ben, why don't you why don't you start? <laughs> More wine. <laughs> is I is I think is I think the common ground where you have to start off. Look, I, I, think, I think that in any of these contentious political conversations, you have to kind of find common ground where you agree on something and launch from there to try and get a, around 
the the rancor that uh, that's going to be coming at you from from all directions. So I think a little bit of sympathy and trying to draw out the reasoning as a learning experience instead of yelling and screaming at somebody you don't agree with is uh, is a pretty good way to do it. And hey, if that fails, uh, hope that you've got the majority of the table on your side. So Sarah, Ben's theory is a lubricate everybody ahead of time. So even if arguments break out, you're probably too hungover the next day to remember what it is you said, all's forgiven. My theory is let's take away turkeys, let's take away silverware, anything that involves a carving knife that could be weaponized. Uh, maybe the Bill Whalen Thanksgiving is a box of pizza or Chinese food with cheap plastic forks. But uh, Ben mentioned, Sarah, the idea of discussing things that people agree upon, but you've been having a lot of conversations with voters. What do voters agree upon? Yeah, I mean, I would go for the photos of kids. Uh, everybody, <laughs> everybody agrees kids are nice and that, uh, try to just, you know, bring it down. But look, I think, um, I do think that these last elections, uh, if I were imagining, uh, some pretty Trumpy family members, I think probably the place I would try to forge some common ground is like, man, you know, uh, I really think the Republican party needs to survive. Uh, that's three election cycles in a row we've just lost. Like, what do you think we should do to to recalibrate? Like, what do you think we should do? Uh, and it, and I think seeing if people are ready to move off Trump, um, seeing and if Sarah, then they'll, but then Sarah they'll say, let's get rid of all the rhinos. So get rid of John McCain and Mitt Romney and the Bushes and so forth. I, yeah. I honestly, I would engage in this argument, and I would say, you know, um, for Katie Hobbs, uh, it looks like about eleven percent of Republicans voted for her. Uh, yeah. Those are McCain Republicans. Those are the rhinos that you're talking about. And I guess the people that are being pushed out of the party are the decisive margin in these really narrow knife's edge races. And so I don't know, what would a bigger tent look like? Like, what, what about what Reagan did trying to build the bigger tent? I don't know. I think um, I think there's an opportunity right now. I think we're in a moment. And I'm not saying that the Thanksgiving table is the most appropriate place to have this conversation, but I do think there's an intra-Republican conversation that needs to be had about uh, how you build a bigger tent, pull back from the brink. Uh, I think everybody should be able to look at the facts and agree that right. um, this is going not going well for them. Mm -hmm. Ben? Well, you know, on the other hand, you, you this election, incumbents got reelected. If if Raphael Warnock wins in Georgia, 28 of 28 incumbent senators got elected. Uh, I think 25 of 26 incumbent governors got reelected. 356 of 365 House members all got elected. So it's an incumbent year. So there is it, it was an incumbent election. So there is some degree of agreement in stability that people like. They did not like the crazy particularly, and incumbents won. And so that may be another factor to point out, in addition to what Sarah is talking about in terms of, of sheer track record, but both of those things point away from the crazy fringe candidates. And that and that's equally true with, with sort of the Democratic left not being successful in electing its main candidate. So that's you know, my next question. If you are, sorry, Sarah, if you are sitting at the table across from somebody who believes that Stacey Abrams was robbed in 2018, Stacey Abrams to her credit conceding this time around, but somebody who truly believes that Democratic candidates, their votes are suppressed in elections, how do you speak to them? I mean, I would point to both the turnout numbers uh, that 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 were there this year. I would point to the fact that it appears um, that people who wanted to vote were able to vote. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I just think for both sides, for people who have been complaining about elections, um, and even for people who have been really concerned about things like violence, like, I think this is an opportunity to tell a really positive story about our elections. Um, mm -hmm. And the fact that potentially, uh, as Ben was saying, like, we are tired of kind of living with that sense that like things could really pop off at any minute. And that actually, like, everything went well, people who wanted to vote were able to vote. Uh, we had long uh, windows of early voting. People voted by mail. Everything was counted. Uh, and it looks like this all went, you know, it, despite there's like a couple of things here and there with people sort of doing some some voter intimidation, mostly out in Arizona. Um, but even there, like it seemed like cops were handling it and everybody was fine. Um, we haven't had any instances of of violence. And I think for as scared as a lot of us were coming mm -hmm. into this, I think that for if you're talking to people on the right or the left, 
being like, you know, what's great. What's great is this election. Everything went really well. It feels like every, you know, everything worked well. And um, just telling a positive story seems, seems like a good place to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and to pick up on Sarah's point, which I think is exactly right. Remember that uh, on the right, there was a lot of articles, and I have no reason to doubt the accuracy of these articles, that there was going to be a massive Republican poll watcher army. And I think there was. I think that there were Republican poll watchers in every precinct where they wanted to have poll watchers. There were no examples of fraud that's been produced. And on the other side, uh, on the left, there has always been charges of suppression. And the left being very worried about Donald Trump had all their poll watchers in the polling place looking for suppression. No election day examples of suppression have come to light. And as Sarah said, the turnout uh, numbers for this election, including in the states that that passed the the so-called Jim Crow 2.0 laws, was pretty high. So uh, the the election system itself and all the election administrators who we've talked to a lot on this show, Bill, and they deserve an incredible shout out uh, and praise for what they've been able to do. I have a thought. Maybe we need to introduce a little history to our Thanksgiving conversations as a way to get into politics, but also get around it, if you will, in this regard. Uh, First of all, Ben and Sarah, Thanksgiving has been politicized in the past. There's a wonderful story going back to the 1930s and Franklin Roosevelt. Roosevelt comes to office in 1933, and he is beseeched by merchants across the country to move the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, Up until 1933, Thanksgiving had been held on the last Thursday in November, because this is where Lincoln said it when he did his proclamation in 1863, and so it was. But in 1933, Thanksgiving was at the very, very end of um, November, and merchants had only about 24 days until Christmas, and they begged Roosevelt to move it up a week, because back then, no Black Fridays, no internet shopping. This is when Christmas shopping got serious, right after Thanksgiving. Interesting enough, Roosevelt did not do it in 1933. He did it in 1939, though, perhaps because he was thinking about running again in 1940, so he's thinking about the economy. But he does change it to the fourth Thursday of Thanksgiving, where we are now, and all hell breaks loose. Schools are furious because they base their calendars and their whole recess plans on the previous week. They have to change calendar makers, which we don't have much of in America anymore. They have to blow up their calendars as well. So it kind of backfires. So there has been politics. But my thought is maybe this, maybe maybe Chef Kinsberg, who is standing at the head of the table as the patriarch of the family, maybe he has to do something as bold as Magistives to pull out Abraham Lincoln's proclamation and read what Lincoln said in 1863 and then have a conversation. What do you think, Ben? What do you think, Sarah? An interesting idea. I, 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 I think my my five and two and a half year old grandsons would definitely benefit from that. I uh, <laughs> hope I don't end up with sweet potatoes on my face. Yeah. You know, if we just get to pick things to read from Lincoln uh, at the Thanksgiving table, I would go with the Lyceum speech. Um, I don't know if if you guys have read that recently, um, but it is it is very much of the moment. Uh, explain, explain its relevance. Yeah, I mean, it really is about how if democracy is going to survive and actually, and of course, back then it was a much younger democracy, a much more fragile democracy. Right. Um, it was about how if it was going to be destroyed, it was going to be destroyed by us, not by some outside force. But if it was going to if it was going to live on, it was going to be because we take care of it. We do something about it. We are active. Uh, it, it is... Um, I just, if you if you go reread it or if you've never read it before, it is sort of a clarion call for us to uh, safeguard our democracy from within, uh, right. and 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 it's it's perfect for the moment. Uh, I, look, I think Sarah's idea is great, and without being flip about it, what what really is a good idea is to restore a little discussion and faith in all of our families about what does make America great, which is its right. election system and the way we choose our leaders. And that, right. that is deserving. Of thanks. And that's why I brought up Lincoln in the first place. Back in the day when I was writing speeches for uh, for a governor of California, we were doing welfare reforms, as tells you, again, Sarah, how old I am. And I had the brilliant idea, being sarcastic again, that I'm going to call a Lincoln scholar and say, what would Abraham Lincoln do about welfare reform? Because Abraham Lincoln was obviously, obviously concerned about the the welfare of, 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 black, of black Americans. And I remember calling up the Lincoln scholar and walking him through the the premise of my speech. And there, there was just a very long pause. And he said, 
Lincoln would have no idea what to do with the situation because it's just a different world. He said Lincoln would be looking at a computer and a smartphone and just be absolutely baffled. But mm-hmm. um, there is a serious point to that. And that part of the challenge in America, I think you guys will agree, is that we have lost, if not lost touch, we've kind of lost our understanding of the roots of the republic, really how the republic is built, which gets into Ben and Sarah, how elections are run, republic versus democracy and so forth. But maybe taking Lincoln in 1863 is so perhaps a way to segue into really the roots of the Republic and what makes America special. But gosh, here is another landmine, and that's 1619 versus 1776. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing about the Thanksgiving table. Mm-hmm. You got time for conversation. And right. uh, I think that those two binaries, actually, I I was just talking about this with somebody. The, the, there, is a, there is a world in which you have to think about 1619, how it led to 1776. And how that led to 2022 and why those things do not have to live as like totally incompatible, uh, you know, binaries. Like these are, these are, these are historical and you don't have to buy into every element of sort of the 1619 project to think about the idea of uh, that you can go back further to think about the American experiment, that you can think about it in new ways, but there's a lot in there that I think we can all agree on. Um, I mean, this is, I think one of the great challenges and opportunities for this generation, all of us right now who are in this moment of um, extreme polarization is to try to force people out of thinking about these things in those binary terms and to think about our whole history in all of its, uh, the, the things that were wrong and then all the beautiful ways in which it set us up to get to this point today, how it remains imperfect, but how much uh, it is still like a beacon of light for the entire world. And it is rooted in something that is nothing short of like magnificent. Um, and that those contradictions are the great beauty of America. And like, that is, it, it's not, and it's too long for a Twitter thread, um, but it is the, telling the whole story is the best part. Yeah. Sarah put that really, really well. And I think one of the, the interesting things about the period in which we're in is that it is really hard to imagine it ever evolved. And one of the real pluses of your suggestion of going back to 1863 or 1619 and 1776, or even World War II or the Vietnam War, is that even when our darkest hours were upon us, we evolved out of it because the basic undergirding of the Republic and the democracy all hung together and proved to be really solid. And while we still may be in, in a bit of the tunnel of Trumpian election denialism, the improvement from 2020 to 2022 and the way the elections went is really an affirmation of our basic institutions and the people who we have in place to to run them. And that um, that is all good. I agree. Would you two ever consider screening your guest for Thanksgiving? Ben, would you go down the family list and say that Aunt Sarah or Uncle Joe is just too nuts to sit at the table? It's just not worth the bother. In other words, do we in any way sit upon free speech? No. I mean, I think part of Part of family is knowing that there will be some uh, different flavors at the table. Sir? Yeah, I think, um, you know, your family is your family and you yes. got a unconditional positive regard. You got to love them no matter what. So it's better to try to find common ground to drink and look at pictures of kids. And if you have to talk politics to try to go deeper, to try to be forward looking, I would say resist temptations, um, which is a thing I can't do on Twitter, but I certainly can do with my family members and people that I love not to like dunk on past transgressions or to say, how could you be like an idiot about X, Y, Z? Like I, this is an exciting, I I don't know. I'm filled with optimism. I am going into Thanksgiving with a tremendous amount of gratitude for the fact that there was a scenario in which a bunch of people who did not believe in certifying elections were going to be in control of our elections in key contested states going forward. That mm-hmm. was that didn't happen. And I think that being grateful for that and trying to now push forward into that moment to try to capitalize on this to actually push for real change, a real reorientation for the Republican Party, um, and to do that with sort of optimism and forward-looking momentum, not looking back and trying to, you know, with recriminations. Uh, I think there are people who deserve recriminations, but they probably aren't at your Thanksgiving table. Um, so that's that's what I would recommend. 
So Ben, maybe it's this. You sit at the head of the table. You're the patriarch. You carve the turkey. You kind of run the show as you do uh, podcasts on uh, flapping my gums and stealing your stealing your act from you. But you do get to kind of set the tone for the dinner. And maybe it's as simply as this. If you're a fan of Seinfeld, for example, you remember that George Costanza's messed up family instead of Christmas, they did what? Festivus, this kind of Festivus crazy holiday. Festivus for the rest of us. Festivus for the rest of us, the airing of grievances. And maybe that's one of the kind of key things to politely impart to your family. We're here to give thanks and love each other, enjoy each other's company. We're not here to vent. I think that's I think that's well said. And you know, look, you you can have real disagreements at the table with your family and with your friends who are there. I mean, I do think that the important part is to come away from the table still being friends and recognizing the good in all the people who you're sitting around the table with, no matter how crazy you may think some of their political ideas are. Yeah, I mean, I just uh you got to try not to fight. These are, this is like, these are like life things. You got to try not to fight with the people that you love the most who are in your family. Like I think, and this is actually, it goes back to something that for me is, is, is actually sort of central. It's why I do the focus groups. Like I, 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 I have a lot of, uh, I have a lot of rage and blame to go around for the people who have been complicit with Trump over the past six years, who engaged in this election denialism, who, who, you know, sort of shunted away all of the the levels manifest on fitness of Donald Trump, but the people who were the big liars, like we have elected officials who were lying to people. Mm -hmm. And the fact that like this fictional uncle of mine, like believed it because every media outlet he listens to and every elected politician that he listens to told him so, like, I'm not going to blame him. I'm going to blame the people who know better, who are cynical uh, abusers of the truth. Um, And I'm going to, I'm going to try to have grace for the people who are the victims of those lies and 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 hold my blame for for the elected officials and the media outlets who do it because they prey on people's fear uh, and hatred of their political adversaries. And um, and I think that people should try to have grace for the people that are in their lives. And it can be hardest, actually, because the people who are in our lives, are the ones we're closest to. And so, like, you know, when you feel like their values are super out of sync with yours, that can be the toughest. But uh I just, I think that the blame is probably not for the people. I mean, unless, unless you're Ivanka, in which case I think you should kick your dad, that your dad should not get to be at the table. Um, but everybody else, your, your family probably didn't, didn't do it. I would pay good money to see the Trump Thanksgiving dinner, just to see what is discussed and to see if anybody, maybe Ivanka and uh, Jared are the two obvious choices. If anybody counters him on anything. You notice, by the way, those two were not in his announcement, I believe. She apparently reportedly is dead set against this election, as is he, because they did not enjoy their time in Washington. So there's differences within the family. But Ben and Sarah, uh, so Sarah, I know you're on Twitter, and you know, I hate to think the kind of stuff that gets sent your way on Twitter. I'm curious if you ever get kind of jumped on in person, if somebody, once they find out your beliefs, if they get into it either in person, or they just rather snark at you. Ben, you spend time in green rooms uh, going on television. Does anybody get contentious in person, or is this more the case of people would rather hide behind the anonymity and veil of social media to, to spew their, their venom? You know, over the years, there have been occasional isolated incidents of somebody who says something. But yeah. by and large, uh, people, the people who come up to me want to talk about specific things. And they're all legitimate kind of interesting questions. So not been bad at all. Sarah? Yeah, I mean, look, I go on television a lot. I get a lot of uh, LinkedIn. People tend to find me on LinkedIn or like Facebook really? Messenger uh, <laughs> to tell me what they yeah. think of something I've said. Uh yeah. And, but, you know, I would say you get as much good as you get bad. Um, The PBS audience is quite nice. Uh, They are very (laughs) sweet. They send you lots of nice mail. Uh, Love doing PBS. Uh, And so, and look, Twitter, though, is a lot of keyboard warriors. And and, um, I would say the people that I have the the most uh, sort of venom back and forth with are people I have never met in my entire life who do not know me, uh, who do not engage with my work. They're just... They have decided that the the never Trumpers are their mortal enemies, um, and so it, whatever. Uh, they, they, who cares? The whole and, point. Listen, you just have to say what you believe. I mean, right, like, yeah, you get right. you're going to get backlash. Like the most important thing, and this is this has been a mantra that I have lived by through this period is like, tell the truth. Truth is in short supply. Say what you think. Don't calibrate. Don't try to walk some line. Say what you believe to be true. 
and and stand by it. But Ben, here's the challenge. Uh, you sit across the table from somebody who gives you five minutes about how Italian satellites stole the election in 2020, and you kind of give them your best poker face, and you have to make a decision. What do I say, or do I just say pass the cranberries? <laughs> yeah, I think you pass the cranberries in a case like that. I really do. I mean, I, I think you can you can maybe suggest some things to read, some other things to read, Yeah. but uh, it's past the cranberry time. Well, that's tricky, Sarah, because asking somebody to read something is kind of like saying politely, here, learn something. <laughs> Come back to me when you actually educated yourself. Yeah, which is, I mean, I guess, I, I mean, you don't say it like that. It's never, it's always nice to get a book recommendation, but look, fine. I don't know. Ask them if uh, they've seen the new uh, the, cra- the crown go, like the, there's, a new, there's a new football. season of the crown on <laughs> like <laughs> let's talk about the politics of a different country uh i i just i honestly i, I understand where you're where you're going with this it is hard to um like genuinely think about a thanksgiving table where i would say you should do everything within your power to not fight with the people that are closest to you in ways that send rifts through you i do think though you should fight for your country and you should say what you believe to the people who are out there doing damage um and you should probably not be uh i mean there's nothing wrong with breaking bread with them i guess but like these are not the people around your thanksgiving table ben college football is easy because almost all the good teams are in red states if you haven't noticed <laughs> My daughter married us into a Michigan family, so uh, I'm all for the Wolverines. Just kind of a purple, blue or purple state these days. And I think smartly they play two days after Thanksgiving, right, Ohio State? Against Ohio State, a deep red state. Okay, uh, final question, guys. Let's wind down this uh, broadcast. Uh, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, You both are striking very optimistic uh, terms, and uh, I really like uh, the idea, Sarah, of just kind of repeatedly bringing up what is great about this country, what we should be thankful for. We are in kind of an odd time right now. The 2022 election is still not over. There's still a Senate race in Georgia. I'm here in California, Sarah, where I don't know, voting is going to go on through Christmas in terms of counts. I'm being sarcastic. It'll be done by early December, but still votes are being counted. Races are still hanging out there. And now the 2024 cycle is underway. So we have an overlap of all things in politics. Um, Let's gaze in the crystal ball and look to Thanksgiving at 2023. How optimistic are you, too, that things are going to be a little better and a little cooler when it comes to not just talking about elections, but just about the health of our democracy? I think we'll be better off because I think we'll have the 2020 period in greater perspective. I mean, look, an awful lot of the temperature that you're talking about a year from now will depend on where Donald Trump is in the universe, because that's Mm -hmm. been the the cause of much of the rancor that's gone on. So, uh, look, I think he's got a tough political road to hoe. And I think that The message from the election with the re-election of so many incumbents is a plea by the American public for stability uh, and less rancor. And so I believe that's where we'll be in Thanksgiving 2023. Sarah, my thought is maybe if you get countered on this a year from now, maybe you put on a cap that says MAF, Make America Florida. In other words, declare yourself a DeSantis. Uh, no, I refuse actually to be forced into the DeSantis Trump binary. As far as I'm concerned, yes. DeSantis is sort of run himself as a Trump understudy, and I don't. I think that's a. It's an absolutely a marginal difference. I think if given the choice between someone who did a coup and someone who hasn't done a coup, you go with the person who has not done a coup. That being said, what I'm sort of excited about about the absolute rejection of these election denialists, you know, we could have been in a scenario where Trump was bouncing out of these midterms with a lot of momentum because a whole bunch right. of his people won. We are not in that scenario now, and as a result. I actually think that if Trump is truly weakened in this moment, then my hope is that a lot of people run. I'm actually optimistic that maybe a year from now, what we have is like a pretty robust field uh, where we're getting presented with a lot of different options about what the future of the Republican Party uh, might look like. And it doesn't have to be just a DeSantis-Trump binary, which a lot of people are trying to make it right now. And I think it's just too soon to say that. I do think, though, one of the things that, uh, again, going back to like how we've learned lessons about Trump is that one thing that happened in 2016 that I do not think will happen again is that you get a big fractured field and everyone keeps knifing each other while Trump kind of skates through with the plurality. I think people will have learned that lesson and they will consolidate around somebody. 
um, and not let Trump win. Uh, that would be I, that would be my my fervent hope. Um, but I do think that if Trump is as weak as he sort of feels like he is in this moment, and again, I say that with an enormous amount of caution, um, but if he is weak, I do think you're going to see a bunch of people get in. And I think we're going to have uh, an intra-party conversation that could be really, really good for the party in the country. What do you think, Ben? You've been through a lot of these cycles now. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Sarah that um, the weaker Trump looks, the more people get in, the more vibrant it it is for the party. I mean, there will be some mechanical things that get done uh, in the setting of the primaries, things like is a winner take all, which probably helps Trump, proportional, it probably hurts him, get to uh, see the maneuvering uh, around the Republican National Committee's decision on the rules over the spring. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I too am hopeful that it is a robust field where lots of different ideas and conceptions get uh, laid out and talked about. Right. So finally, I'm in South Carolina right now gathering with family for Thanksgiving. And this is uh, kind of a different gathering, if you will. You think South Carolina is very conservative, but the the two individuals in my family are probably most passionate about politics other than me. Um, they vote Democratic usually, and they're very worked up about abortion. Uh, so I'm going to hear a lot of that from them. I'm not going to hear much from the Trump side of the family. They tend to be very quiet. Those who do vote for Trump, they just don't wear it on their sleeve. Ben, Sarah, let's talk about what you're going to do on Thanksgiving Day. Do you have any fun family traditions? Do you play touch football? Do you do a little volunteer work? Do you go for turkey trot runs? What, uh, Ben, how are you going to spend your Thanksgiving? We have gone for turkey trot runs in the past. I think that uh, in honor of the five-year-old and the two-and-a-half-year-old, we will uh, more likely be hitting the playground this time. Usually okay. we're up in Massachusetts in the Berkshires. This year we'll be in D.C. And uh, I think whatever whatever the rulers of the home, which is the five-year-old and the two-year-old want, we'll be doing. Sarah, you're coming out of an election. I imagine you are tired. I really appreciate you giving us time today. Tell me you're doing something very fun, very rewarding on Thanksgiving Day. You know, both sides of the family uh, are going to be in town. We're going to host. Uh, we also six and a four year old uh, there. And so, you know, I, I love Thanksgiving. I just it's like a such a warm holiday. Um, and so I'm just really excited to be uh, with our family in D.C., uh, and, uh, you know, my, my, my brothers are great at making cocktails. Uh, and I think, uh, I'm hoping that we, cause you know, we're, we're a divided political family as well. And my hope is that we, we all look at how cute the six and four year old are. <laughs> and, uh, we focus on that, have a few drinks and everybody can just look into the future. My family has four charming four little boys who are between the ages of six and four. They're my sister's uh, grandsons, my grandnephews. If you cannot agree on the cuteness of those kids, I give up. Uh, <laughs> so, Ben, I think we're back to the Ginsburg strategy from what Sarah's saying and get lubricated. But, my God, how many legal claims do I have to file if I go to Ben Ginsburg for Thanksgiving? <laughs> oh, no legal claims at all. We might put you to work making a pie or something. I'll be making the stuffing, you know. That, that, that's the only thing you'll have to worry about. You guys like the cranberry sauce uh, with the straight out of the can or, or do you like it to be homemade? Oh, my beloved wife does only homemade and it's excellent. So Sarah, yeah. I'm a child ultimately of the sixties and seventies. I'm a can kind of guy. And Ben, if you want me to cook, that's probably what you want to put me in charge of. You're in charge of the, of the cranberry loaf. <laughs> oh, but, oh, opening up the can you're there. Yeah, I like that. I like to see the ring marks on it. That's the from the can. <laughs> That's right. I love it. One big hey. gelatinous cube. Okay. Hey, we opened with turducken. Let's close with turducken. Let's uh let's do a little polling here, Sarah and Ben. Yay or nay on turducken? Ben, yay or nay? Yay, but not necessarily for Thanksgiving. Oh, you're such a lawyer. <laughs> yeah. Sarah, yay or nay? Uh yay if somebody else cooks it. Uh, I don't think I've ever had one. All three of them are good individually. I assume they are times three good together. I think you want to deep fry them if you want a real taste thrill. Mm. There you go. Uh, I'm with you, Sarah. I'd like to try it out of curiosity. And Ben, I'm with you. I'm not sure I'd want to roll the dice on Thanksgiving with it. Mm -hmm. okay. Tradition. Tradition. Well, Ben and Sarah, thanks for coming on today. Uh, thanks for this conversation. Uh, Sarah, thanks for all the great work that you do. Uh, I encourage our, our viewers to keep a track of Sarah, follow her on Twitter, follow her writing. Ben Ginsburg, you're a gift to the Hoover Institution. I've enjoyed working with you on St. Sears and Dow Salvageables and I want the world to know we're going to keep doing stuff in 2023 and beyond on this beat. So as we mentioned on this show, this issue is not going away anytime soon. So Ben will be here at Hoover, hopefully leading us through it. Thanks for doing this. And it's uh, great that Sarah could be on as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank 
thanks for having me, guys. I'm a big uh, Ben Ginsburg fan. Uh, so <laughs> nice happy Thanksgiving to all. Yes. Uh, yes. And on that note, I would like to wish a happy uh, Thanksgiving to all of you watching this for us, the Hoover Institution. On behalf of my colleague, Ben Ginsberg, our special guest today, Sarah Longwell, we hope you enjoyed the conversation. We hope you have a joyful, thankful, and peaceful, serene Thanksgiving. Take care. Thanks for watching.